Hi, I'm Abhijit Banerjee. And I'm Esther Duflo. This is Hashtag Read Instead, an online literary festival hosted by Juggernaut Books. And, and we are here to talk about the impact of COVID on the world economy and what possibly we could do about it. So I'm going to start by asking some questions of Esther. Esther, what do you think is the most, the biggest problem right now? If you had to take one problem that you would think, and I want two answers, one for right now and one for the next one year. So for right now, saving lives is probably the biggest uh, problem or the fact that there will be many lives potentially lost. Uh, for the near term, it will be getting back to um, a normal economy, making sure people are able to work, making sure that whatever effort we are making now to save lives doesn't snowball into a, such a big economic crisis that we lose further lives or further livelihoods anyways, uh, as a consequence of what's happening now. To save lives, so some good, uh, what do you propose to do about it? Well, this is when uh, you know you sometimes uh, regret your choice of uh, of um, career. <laughs> I don't feel I have any particular expertise to write, but so the, the only thing I can do is to listen to what the doctor says. Even the doctors, to be honest, are trying to find out what makes sense. And um, what do we know? Well, very little. We don't even know what is the mortality rate of this virus. We know it's bad. We know it's worse than. Than, much worse than the flu. And uh, we also know that we don't have a vaccine yet. We also know that we don't have a cure yet. And anybody who says that they have a cure or a vaccine right now or anything to prevent this right now is telling lies and potentially dangerous lies. People are working on cures. People are working on vaccines, but it's going to take some time. So the only thing we can do now is to try and prevent the transmission of the virus. Uh, as individuals, the only thing we can do is to uh, try to isolate ourselves from, unfortunately, pretty much anybody except our close family because there are not enough tests to know who might be uh, affected and who is not affected. The other things we can do is to practice good hygiene and in particular very good hand washing so that if we come in contact with someone who is infected, we can actually prevent the transmission. Or, or if we are ourselves infected, we can prevent the transmission to them. But don't you think that it's extremely hard for people to practice such kind of unnatural lifestyles for the foreseeable future? I mean, how long do you think people can last in this mode where they're not working, they're not earning, they're not going out, they're not meeting their loved ones? I mean, is, this a, is this a realistic enterprise for six months? Do you think that, uh, you think that, that poses some challenges? I think it's totally uncharted territory. I think it's, it could be unsustainable for two weeks. Um, it's, I would say almost for sure it's unsustainable for six months. And uh, right now, as much as doctors are navigating without much visibility, policymakers are nav navigating with even less possibility because on top of the uncertainty that have to do with um, the virus itself, there is all the uncertainty that have to do with what uh, people can sustain, sustainably practice over the long run. And that, I think, now I'm going to turn the question to you and say, well, given that, if you were in charge, uh, say in the US to start with, when would you have started the, uh, this kind of isolation curfew type technologies? You can sense with President Trump that there was a lot of hesitancy or stop, go, uh, we shouldn't do it, we should do it, uh, we can do it for some time, but we will stop in April. And that hesitancy itself seems to be costly because people don't know how to adapt to it. But if you had been, you know, President Fauci in the US, what would you have done? I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough call. I mean, it seems like if you, the model says five months, the model is based on numbers that people basically plucked out of the air. So five months for this kind of, you know, full shutdown strategy, which means we don't let some people get sick. There's an alternative which seems frightening to contemplate, but maybe some cases perhaps more realistic, which is to pick a shorter window, 
focus around the around the peak before and after the peak and try to to make sure that that the peak itself is not as bad as it can, has to be but you know i, I think keep keep the window uh, significantly um, shorter and more focused so and the problem with that and i there i can't say that i i know which way i would go if i were put in the hot seat is um you know that involves making the choice that we will actually let some people die i mean more people will die probably in the scenario where we shut it down uh later uh, unless we believe that the whole thing is not sustainable if we believe that the whole thing is not sustainable then of course you know and maybe that's the case in many developing countries if you try to have a five month shutdown in people's livelihoods people will just stop believing that it's a sensible policy and then then you are kind of up up against it so uh, if it's credible i feel like there's a trade off between i think save, saving real lives but possibly at an enormous enforcement cost and enormous cost to the economy and uh, doing do, doing less good in terms of saving lives but possibly easier to sustain economically and i i don't and i can't say that i have a you know it's it's, it's real life so I, i can't say that i would have an easy choice there i think that going back to the question of of just what is the mortality rate how do you, how do we know the mortality rate i mean isn't it the case that basically all of this is a bit uh, dependent on actually how many people are infected and are not symptomatic I mean, yeah. and a lot depends on that because uh, if there is already a lot of asymptomatic infected people we are closer to herd immunity than we thought we are so all kinds of things would be very different if we, if we believe that you know it was 100 million people have been infected already rather than whatever much smaller number yeah my, my understanding uh, from talking to various uh, people who are more specialists than <laughs> in Europe us is that uh we don't know either the number of deaths or the number of infected people so that of course makes it very difficult to estimate the ratio of the two which is the mortality rate so we don't know the number of deaths because we don't count them uh very systematically for example in France where I come from anybody who die in a retirement home is not counted as a covid death because you only count it as a covid death if you happen to die in a hospital but a lot of people die in retirement home and never make it to the hospital so the number of death is not properly calculated that might be a, that's an un- a french specific it's, it's an underestimate we have no we have it surely is that you know in in india the somebody who dies in a village without ever being diagnosed an elderly person they die of old age they die of old age yeah. so we have a lot of people in france right now dying of old age and it will take some months to know that what they to estimate what they died of because they've never been tested and they've not been recorded so we don't have the proper number of deaths and probably we have an underestimate now on the other side we also don't test everybody systematically so we don't have the number of cases either which means that we don't have the mortality rate and in fact the mortality rate as calculated seems to vary widely from country to country so a country like uh, the northern of europe denmark sweden etc have mortality rate of 0.5% uh, and meanwhile italy has a mortality rate of 10% so everything hinges on what's the what is the reason for the difference between the two the very positive scenario is where the difference between the two comes from the fact that there is more tested down in the northern country and therefore uh, we have something more akin to uh, a population rate and that in Italy you only tested if you are you know presenting with very very bad symptoms so we have something akin to the mortality rate among people who are already in a very bad shape that's the optimistic scenario because that would mean that the mortality rate is much lower than we think and therefore that would mean that if we had an approximate count of the number of deaths and we multiplied it backwards by the mortality rate we would know that actually a lot of people have been infected already which means they are immune hopefully and which means that it may be not even that bad the pessimistic case is where if if uh, the entire difference between the northern countries and italy comes from uh, poor care in italy and there is surely some truth to that because italy for example for years had uh, basically disinvested in the public hospitals 
So they're just not, they were absolutely not equipped in the northern of Italy to face the onslaught of cases that they get. They don't have ventilators, they don't have beds, they don't have physical beds to put people. The, the medical uh, prof um, professionals are overwhelmed. Per person in Italy, they are one fifth of the number of uh, ventilators that there is in, in Germany, for example. So surely part of it is also the fact that conditional on getting seriously sick, you're more likely to die in Italy. So in between these two, so either it's, it's not likely that it's all because of work care, it's not likely that it's all before, because of more testing, so it's probably somewhere in between. And I don't think anybody knows where in between. So basically speaking, India. What do you think India should think of this mortality rate? Uh, what, what should it benchmark it to? Well, what, what, I mean, if they had to take some call, what would they, or take the, yeah, take the, uh, for that matter, the um, fracture of people who become seriously sick. I mean, this is, this is a key number because with a country of India's size, you could imagine it, it being millions and millions of people who are seriously sick with just nowhere near the capacity. I mean, the, the whole ventilators, I mean, just doing nothing. I was hoping to ask you the India question, uh, but if we don't know about what's happening in Europe and the US, I think we know even less what might be happening in India, or for that matter, in a lot of other countries. For one, we don't know very much about how this virus likes to be cold and hot and humid. And there are some people who hope that uh, when the weather becomes warmer in the, in the, um, in, in the northern country, it would um, be less lethal. And one hope, in that, if that were to be the case, then you would have less uh, infections in, in India. But we don't know that because it's a new virus and so far, I don't think there is any knowledge about how it reacts to different weather. I mean, the correlations people look at, but the correlations that are, ex uh, you know, they're comparing different places, and some of those places are also have, uh, you know, people living in different ways, and the density is different, and everything else is different. Yes. And, and, yes. In and fact, the testing is different, so it's not that we even know how yeah. many people. So, so far, I don't think, oh, I, my, the sum total of my knowledge comes from, uh, Anthony Fauci, who I heard uh, say, we have no idea, because this is a new virus, so this is, I'm just repeating that. Maybe since then he knows a little bit better, because the knowledge increases every day. But so we don't know, we don't know, no, very few people got tested, obviously, in any of the poorer countries. Uh, we know that there are some pre-existing conditions, like uh, diabetes and uh, um, uh, COPD or uh, hypertension, uh, asthma, etc. That 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 makes it worse. Um, so that would it's be extremely prevalent they, in, in India. We're talking about an NCD crisis. Uh, run, in the run up to this, we were already talking about NCD crisis in India. And uh, I was wondering for myself what how it interacts with with prior exposures of years of pollution in the in the cities that are. Uh, the most polluted India, some of the most polluted cities, and people's lungs are hurt by that. And they say that being a smoker is a, also a condition that makes it worse. And it seems to me that many people who live in Delhi basically ha 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 would look very similar yeah. to people having smoked a, a pack of cigarettes a day for most of their lives. So we don't know that, like how bad it will be. On the other hand, there are also you know, younger people and children who don't think it's much, asked. much, much younger than this. Average age uh, is 28 years, is it, is it is 45 years, so India is an extremely young country. That's, yes. that's good news. So that goes, in the favor of, that goes in the favor of India. And of course, the, as you were pointing out, the, the healthcare system is, is in such a strain anyways, and incapable of providing basic services anyways. Uh, there are also many providers, most people get most of their cares from providers who are not uh, qualified. Uh, I think for these providers, maybe in the normal course of affairs, at least they have some rule of thumbs that they have developed. And a lot of them are well-meaning and just, you know, trying to do their best mm -hmm. in the circumstances. Uh, but unless they are trained to identify the, the, the symptoms of of COVID and to and unless they are given a procedure that they must follow in different cases, um, they they have absolutely no capacity to to yeah. handle what's happening. Don't have ventilators. Yes, and we don't have ventilators. But even at the lower level, they, what want, are they going to, to do to provide to propose steroid, uh, one shot of antibiotic for someone who prevents with COVID-induced pneumonia? 
So that's that's very scary. That's quite India specific scary, even across the other developing countries, because I think the phenomenon of this vast number of informal providers who are filling this it's, it's Asian. This boy, it's, it's Asian, it's Asian. It's less, less African. Yeah, so in Africa, there are fewer providers and they need to be trained, but at least people are more used to go to the, to go to yeah, the health yeah, clinic. Yeah, so yeah. one could imagine doing some uh, uh, online training of the act of the real providers of the of the and those are also real providers, but of the say accredited providers, nurses, doctors, mm -hmm. etc., uh, uh, and and launch it that way. In India, one would think of incorporating those people in a training, which is possible, but will require like one more step of of thinking it through. And partly because they're not even we don't know who those providers are. There's no database in some since they're not supposed to exist. There's no database of those people. Yeah. It's not like West Bengal, a few states have sort of have kind of decided to engage with them, but mostly they don't really exist and therefore or they don't exist and, and therefore they're not they're not easy to engage in this process. In fact, if we can turn now I can uh, ask you a question. I know that you've been working in West Bengal with these providers. Do you have an idea about how how uh, what role they could play in this crisis in West Bengal and of course elsewhere based on your experience and uh, how they need to be brought in, both in order to um, promote good behavior and also to, to, to help with the treatment. Yeah, let me answer that. I would like to go back to the world economy. I will go, uh, I will go back. Uh, so I, th I think the answer is the, they are capable of being trained. We have some evidence that they are. So if, if there's a way to provide them with a video each of uh, on WhatsApp, I suspect every one of them is on WhatsApp. You send them a video saying these are the symptoms that uh, you should look for. And if so, if, I think the most important thing that they can do right now is just report. I think in general, reporting so that we have identified the clusters where it's going to explode. And that's critical because then, given that these guys are not going to have the ventilators, we want someone to with the ventilators to be able to, ac to access the hotspots. So I think if we think of what what this current lockdown does is to kind of slow down the spread and um, maybe concentrate it so that some places where a lot of people already were infected is, is not going to change very much maybe because it's impossible to enforce it perfectly and in other places maybe it's going to be you know it turns out that this village nobody is yet infected so it's going to take a while before it shows up probably will show up through contact outside but then what we would observe is a whole pattern of you know, here there is a real hot spot, and here the you're 20 miles away. There's nothing. That's a if that's what's happening, then it should be possible to deploy the healthcare system more flexibly. We just create SWAT teams of doctors, nurses, maybe equipment, and move them there, or move them make make sure that they are in the nearest private or public hospital. Just requisition the hospital, make sure that you are you're waiting there for any cases, and bring the cases out, and don't be too careful about uh, you know making sure that they have the disease, treat the hotspot as being, we're going to get everyone out, put everyone else into quarantine and do it at the hotspot level. That might actually be a management strategy that has some, some chance of working. So that's, that's the, the optimistic view is get as many reporting channels, open up the reporting channels, get these guys who are the first point of contact for many, many health, uh, you know, people health problems. Just tell them that, you know, please report whatever it is. You can do whatever you want to do, but please report that I see somebody with, you know, who's having breathing problems and high fever. Just report those people across the board. Let's not debate whether this is actually viral pneumonia or not. On the disease, one quick quick question. One key bottleneck is, is testing. And it seems to me that India would be in a good place to manufacture tons of testing since it has this... Uh, this Huge amazing industry. industry. Do you think that's that's true for India and for the world? Yes, I think it would be. I think that the the property rights issues need to be resolved fast. Somebody should buy it out and just say that look, you know, okay, here's a billion dollars. Just do it. Just do it. And now anybody can produce it, and we just have testing of the tests, yeah, so that we don't have the you know fake tests. But uh, but yeah, I, I would say this is the ideal scenario for someone to buy out the uh, the property rights. For, I mean, maybe just temporarily buy the property right for six months. But I think if somebody, and at this point, I would say the company that says, well, we won't actually sell it to you unless you give us enough money, I think it's just going to be so abhorrent that probably they won't be able to sustain it. 
So I think that's that's one one hope that hopefully will be activated. So now world economy. So economists are uh, kind of used to do uh, trade-offs, and that's I must say a very very uncomfortable time to be an economist because you're thinking about trade-off between lives and uh, being and, and livelihoods in a way that we are just not used to to count. So what's your how how do you feel? I'm not going to say how I feel. I, I feel so conflicted that I don't think that's a useful thing for me to say. I mean, I feel, I feel like that what is important is to recognize that no one is going to be uh, willing to take this forever. They just start being. They're going to be, you know, whatever. They imagine that the government actually does implement um, effective free PDS. So the, in a place like India, they can actually eat. Just eating is just not going to be enough for people who have had a more you know, better life for, uh, and you tell them for the next year or six months or five months, you're going to just stay at home and eat, um, you know, the, the, the seven kilos of rice that you get or whatever from the PDS. I just don't think it's sustainable. So I think sustainability is a key concern and the government right now is, the lockdown is short and that's probably sensible. Um, and hopefully that will already have some slowing effect and then we'll have to let go people and do this more targeted strategy or hotspots and all that that was suggesting. I don't see a way of keeping this going for. So with the mindset that we're fighting a battle over five or six months. So if so, the economy might be not too damaged if this, but the world economy is in free fall. And because I think the rich countries are going to enforce a, uh, a lockdown, They're, they won't buy anything. They're not going to buy anything. The whole world economy is going to start to shrink and that's completely a given. I think we're going to have a massive recession. The question is, in some sense, is it the case that this recession, because it's not driven by kind of people fundamentally, uh, uh, the, the rich people losing a lot of their um, income, maybe, or not rich, middle class people rich losing their homes, maybe it is the case that they have a little bit more slack and maybe it's the case that uh, they're going to, once this period is over, they'll start spending and maybe they'll revive the economy. I think that's less and less likely as it goes because essentially incomes are shrinking even for the middle classes, the stock market has collapsed completely. So my guess is that it's not, there's not going to be a consumption boom, a big okay. consumption boom right at the end of this. And therefore we need, we probably need policies that keep going for a while and try to imagine, you know, how to feed the demand back into the system. Because I suspect that people will be just will you know, they would have lost so much income and so much wealth that they're going to be sitting on whatever they have. That's the, that's the core worry at the end of this, is does consumption resume? Like, is it a consumption boom? Because it's like, this is the end of the Second World War and people start buying stuff, or is it the, this is the end of, um, the middle of the 2009 crisis and people are still frightened by it and they're not buying things? And I don't know the answer to exactly how that's going to play out, but I'm getting more pessimistic. If so, I think more interventionism is going to be the way to go. Uh, that's all I can say. And, kind of, and then the countries like India, where I would say the government is being too conservative right now, they should know the fact that the you know the oil prices are falling. I don't think they should worry about the inflation at all. Let print some money. Quantitative easing has been all the West has adopted quantitative easing. It's I, I think we, we 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 need to quantitatively ease in India and in large quantities. It's also something about uh, uh, just the, the practicality of getting the money to people uh, that without we, getting them infected and sending, them, sending infected. them to the post office to pick up the money and all that. Yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, that's an issue in the U.S. as well. Actually, it turns out, but in India, you know, this is a whole this jam trinity which they're supposed to be using. Let's see. Let's bring it into play. Let's try. I think this is the time to try go go kind of wild on the Keynesian side. I, I don't see a reason to be conservative right now. Um, thank you for listening to us. All of this uh, is sort of new to us. We, 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 we have a new book out, which in, if you have leisure, you can read. It's um, called uh, Good Economics for Hard Times. We are in hard times. It's, it's sort of relevant in some distant way. And it's available free uh, for now, as long as the curfew lasts on, uh, on the Juggernaut uh, app. So read it. Stay safe and take care of your loved ones. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.